Chapter 40 of Moral Letters, Volume 1 by Seneca, translated by Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 40. On the proper style for a philosopher's discourse. I thank you for writing to me so often, for you are revealing your real self to me in the only way you can. I never receive a letter from you without being in your company forthwith. If the pictures of our absent friends are pleasing to us, though they only refresh the memory and lighten our longing by a solace that is unreal and unsubstantial, how much more pleasant is a letter, which brings us real traces, real evidences of an absent friend. For that which is sweetest when we meet face to face is afforded by the impress of a friend's hand upon his letter. Recognition you write me that you heard a lecture by the philosopher Serapio, footnote, this person cannot be identified, when he landed at your present place of residence. He is wont, you say, to wrench up his words with a mighty rush, and he does not let them flow forth one by one, but makes them crowd and dash upon each other, for the words come in such quantity that a single voice is inadequate to utter them. I do not approve of this in a philosopher. His speech, like his life, should be composed, and nothing that rushes headlong and is hurried is well ordered. That is why, in Homer, the rapid style which sweeps down without a break like a snow squall is assigned to the younger speaker. From the old man, Eloquence flows gently, sweeter than honey. Therefore, mark my words, that a forceful manner of speech, rapid and copious, is more suited to a mountebank than to a man who is discussing and teaching an important and serious subject. But I object just as strongly that he should drip out his words as that he should go at top speed. He should neither keep the ear on the stretch nor definite, for that poverty-stricken and thin-spun style also makes the audience less attentive, because they are weary of its stammering slowness. Nevertheless, the word which has been long awaited sinks in more easily than the word which flits past us on the wing. Finally, people speak of handing down precepts to their pupils. But one is not handing down that which eludes the grasp. Besides, speech that deals with the truth should be unadorned and plain. This popular style has nothing to do with the truth. Its aim is to impress the common herd, to ravish heedless ears by its speed. It does not offer itself for discussion, but snatches itself away from discussion. But how can that speech govern others? which cannot itself be governed. May I not also remark that all speech which is employed for the purpose of healing our minds ought to sink into us? Remedies do not avail unless they remain in the system. Besides, this sort of speech contains a great deal of sheer emptiness. It has more sound than power. My terrors should be quieted, my irritations soothed, my illusions shaken off, my indulgences checked, my greed rebuked. And which of these cures can be brought about in a hurry? What physician can heal his patient on a flying visit? May I add that such a jargon of confused and ill-chosen words cannot afford pleasure either? No, but just as you are well satisfied, in the majority of cases, to have seen through tricks which you did not think could possibly be done, so in the case of these word gymnasts, to have heard them once is amply sufficient. For what can a man desire to learn or to imitate in them? What is he to think of their souls when their speech is sent into the charge in utter disorder and cannot be kept in hand, just as when you run downhill you cannot stop at the point where you had decided to stop, 
but your steps are carried along by the momentum of your body and are borne beyond the place where you wish to halt, so this speed of speech has no control over itself, nor is it seemly for philosophy, since philosophy should carefully place her words, not fling them out, and should proceed step by step. What then, you say? Should not philosophy sometimes take a loftier tone? Of course she should, but dignity of character should be preserved, and this is stripped away by such violent and excessive force. Let philosophy possess great forces, but kept well under control. Let her stream flow unceasingly, but never become a torrent and i should hardly allow even to an orator a rapidity of speech like this which cannot be called back which goes lawlessly ahead for how could it be followed by jurors who are often inexperienced and untrained even when the orator is carried away by his desire to show off his powers or by uncontrollable emotion even then he should not quicken his pace and heap up words to an extent greater than the ear can endure. You will be acting rightly, therefore, if you do not regard those men who seek how much they may say rather than how they shall say it. And if for yourself you choose, provided a choice must be made, to speak as Publius Vinicius, the stammerer, does, when Asellius was asked how Vinicius spoke, he replied, Gradually. It was a remark of Geminus Varius, by the way. I don't see how you can call that man eloquent. Why, he can't get out three words together. Why, then, should you not choose to speak as Vinicius does? Though, of course, some wag may cross your path, like the person who said, when Vinicius was dragging out his words one by one, as if he were dictating and not speaking, Say, haven't you got anything to say? And yet, that were the better choice, for the rapidity of Quintus Haterius, the most famous orator of his age, is, in my opinion, to be avoided by a man of sense. Haterius never hesitated, never paused, he had no sooner begun than he was through. Footnote. Confer the Greek proverb, Hama epos, hama ergon. No sooner said than done. A construction imitated by Seneca. And footnote. However, I suppose that certain styles of speech are more or less suitable to nations also. In a Greek, you can put up with the unrestrained style, but we Romans, even when writing, have become accustomed to separate our words. Footnote, the Greek texts were still written without separation of the words, in contrast with the Roman. And our compatriot Cicero, with whom Roman oratory sprang into prominence, was also a slow pacer. The Roman language is more inclined to be circumspect, to weigh, and to offer something worth weighing. Fabianus, a man noteworthy because of his life, his knowledge, and less important than either of these, his eloquence also, used to discuss a subject with dispatch rather than with haste. Hence you might call it ease rather than speed. I approve this quality in the wise man, but I do not demand it. Only let his speech proceed unhampered, though I prefer that it should be deliberately uttered rather than spouted. However, I have this further reason for frightening you away from the latter malady, namely that you could only be successful in practicing this style by losing your sense of modesty. You would have to rub all shame from your countenance. Footnote. Confer Marshall, Book 11, Number 27, Line 7. Aut cum perfricuit frontem posuitque pudorem. After a violent rubbing, the face would not show blushes. End footnote. You would have to rub all shame from your countenance, and refuse to hear yourself speak. 
for that heedless flow will carry with it many expressions which you would wish to criticize. And, I repeat, you could not attain it, and at the same time preserve your sense of shame. Moreover, you would need to practice every day, and transfer your attention from subject matter to words. But words, even if they came to you readily and flowed without any exertion on your part, yet would have to be kept under control. For just as a less ostentatious gait becomes a philosopher, so does a restrained style of speech, far removed from boldness. Therefore the ultimate kernel of my remarks is this. I bid you be slow of speech. Farewell. End of chapter 40「Chapter 41 of Moral Letters, Volume 1, by Seneca, translated by Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 41. On the God Within Us You are doing an excellent thing, one which will be wholesome for you, if, as you write me, you are persisting in your effort to attain sound understanding. It is foolish to pray for this when you can acquire it from yourself. We do not need to uplift our hands towards heaven, or to beg the keeper of a temple to let us approach his idol's ear, as if in this way our prayers were more likely to be heard. God is near you. He is with you. He is within you. This is what I mean, Lucilius. A holy spirit indwells within us, one who marks our good and bad deeds, and is our guardian. As we treat this spirit, so are we treated by it. Indeed, no man can be good without the help of God. Can one rise superior to fortune unless God helps him to rise? He it is that gives noble and upright counsel. In each good man, quote, a God doth dwell, but what God we know not. Footnote. Virgil, Aeneid, Book 8, Line 352. End footnote. If ever you have come upon a grove that is full of ancient trees which have grown to an unusual height, shutting out a view of the sky by a veil of pleached and intertwining branches, then the loftiness of the forest, the seclusion of the spot, and your marvel at the thick unbroken shade in the midst of the open spaces, will prove to you the presence of deity. Or if a cave, made by the deep crumbling of the rocks, holds up a mountain on its arch, a place not built with hands but hollowed out into such spaciousness by natural causes, your soul will be deeply moved by a certain intimation of the existence of God. We worship the sources of mighty rivers. We erect altars at places where great streams burst suddenly from hidden sources. We adore springs of hot water as divine, and consecrate certain pools because of their dark waters or their immeasurable depth. If you see a man who is unterrified in the midst of dangers, untouched by desires, happy in adversity, peaceful amid the storm, who looks down upon men from a higher plane and views the gods on a footing of equality, will not a feeling of reverence for him steal over you? Will you not say, this quality is too great and too lofty to be regarded as resembling this petty body in which it dwells. A divine power has descended upon that man. When a soul rises superior to other souls, when it is under control, when it passes through every experience as if it were of small account, when it smiles at our fears and at our prayers, it is stirred by a force from heaven. A thing like this cannot stand upright unless it be propped by the divine. Therefore a greater part of it abides in that place from whence it came down to earth. 
just as the rays of the sun do indeed touch the earth but still abide at the source from which they are sent even so the great and hallowed soul which has come down in order that we may have a nearer knowledge of divinity does indeed associate with us but still cleaves to its origin on that source it depends thither it turns its gaze and it strives to go and it concerns itself with our doings only as a being superior to ourselves what then is such a soul one which is resplendent with no external good but only with its own for what is more foolish than to praise in a man the qualities which come from without and what is more insane than to marvel at characteristics which may at the next instant be passed on to someone else a golden bit does not make a better horse the lion with gilded mane in process of being trained and forced by weariness to endure the decoration is sent into the arena in quite a different way from the wild lion whose spirit is unbroken the latter indeed bold in his attack as nature wished him to be impressive because of his wild appearance and it is his glory that none can look upon him without fear is favored in preference to the other lion that languid and gilded brute footnote the spectators of the fight which is to take place between the two lions applaud the wild lion and bet on him and footnote no man ought to glory except in that which is his own we praise a vine if it makes the shoots teem with increase if by its weight it bends to the ground with the very poles which hold its fruit would any man prefer to this vine one from which golden grapes and golden leaves hang down in a vine the virtue peculiarly its own is fertility in a man also we should praise that which is his own suppose that he has a retinue of comely slaves and a beautiful house that his farm is large and large his income none of these things is in the man himself they are all on the outside praise the quality in him which cannot be given or snatched away that which is the peculiar property of the man do you ask what this is it is soul and reason brought to perfection in the soul for man is a reasoning animal therefore man's highest good is attained if he has fulfilled the good for which nature designed him at birth and what is it which this reason demands of him the easiest thing in the world to live in accordance with his own nature but this is turned into a hard task by the general madness of mankind we push one another into vice and how can a man be recalled to salvation when he has none to restrain him and all mankind to urge him on farewell end of chapter forty one chapter forty two of moral letters volume one by seneca translated by gummier this librivox recording is in the public domain forty two on values has that friend of yours already made you believe that he is a good man and yet it is impossible in so short a time for one either to become good or to be known as such do you know what kind of man i now mean when i speak of a good man i mean one of the second grade like your friend for one of the first class perhaps springs into existence like the phoenix only once in five hundred years and it is not surprising either that greatness develops only at long intervals fortune often brings into being commonplace powers which are born to please the mob but she holds up for our approval that which is extraordinary by the very fact that she makes it rare this man however of whom you spoke is still far from the state which he professes to have reached 
and if he knew what it meant to be a good man, he would not yet believe himself such. Perhaps he would even despair of his ability to become good. But, you say, he thinks ill of evil men. Well, so do evil men themselves, and there is no worse penalty for vice than the fact that it is dissatisfied with itself and all its fellows. But he hates those who make an ungoverned use of great power suddenly acquired. I retort that he will do the same thing as soon as he acquires the same powers. In the case of many men, their vices, being powerless, escape notice, although as soon as the persons in question have become satisfied with their own strength, the vices will be no less daring than those which prosperity has already disclosed. These men simply lack the means whereby they may unfold their wickedness. Similarly, one can handle even a poisonous snake while it is stiff with cold. The poison is not lacking. It is merely numbed into inaction. In the case of many men, their cruelty, ambition, and indulgence only lack the favor of fortune to make them dare crimes that would match the worst. That their wishes are the same, you will in a moment discover in this way. Give them the power equal to their wishes. Do you remember how, when you declared that a certain person was under your influence, I pronounced him fickle and a bird of passage, and said that you held him not by the foot, but merely by a wing? Was I mistaken? You grasped him only by a feather. He left it in your hands and escaped. You know what an exhibition he afterwards made of himself before you. How many of the things he attempted were to recoil upon his own head. He did not see that in endangering others he was tottering to his own downfall. He did not reflect how burdensome were the objects which he was bent upon attaining, even if they were not superfluous. Therefore, with regard to the objects which we pursue, and for which we strive with great effort, we should note this truth. Either there is nothing desirable in them, or the undesirable is preponderant. Some objects are superfluous, others are not worth the price we pay for them. But we do not see this clearly, and we regard things as free gifts, when they really cost us very dear. Our stupidity may be clearly proved by the fact that we hold that buying refers only to the objects for which we pay cash, and we regard as free gifts the things for which we spend our very selves. These we should refuse to buy if we were compelled to give in payment for them our houses or some attractive and profitable estate but we are eager to attain them at the cost of anxiety, of danger, and of lost honor, personal freedom, and time. So true it is that each man regards nothing as cheaper than himself. Let us therefore act in all our plans and conduct, just as we are accustomed to act whenever we approach a huckster who has certain wares for sale. Let us see how much we must pay for that which we crave. Very often the things that cost nothing cost us the most heavily. I can show you many objects, the quest and acquisition of which have wrested freedom from our hands. We should belong to ourselves if only these things did not belong to us. I would therefore have you reflect thus, not only when it is a question of gain, but also when it is a question of loss. This object is bound to perish. Yes, it was a mere extra. You will live without it just as easily as you have lived before. If you have possessed it for a long time, you lose it after you have had your fill of it. If you have not possessed it long, then you lose it before you have become wedded to it. You will have less money. Yes and less trouble, less influence, yes, and less envy. Look about you and note the things that drive us mad, which we lose with a flood of tears. 
you will perceive that it is not the loss that troubles us with reference to these things, but a notion of loss. No one feels that they have been lost, but his mind tells him that it has been so. He that owns himself has lost nothing. But how few men are blessed with ownership of self. Farewell. End of chapter 42「Chapter forty three of Moral Letters, Volume One by Seneca, translated by Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Forty three on the Relativity of Fame. Do you ask how the news reached me, and who informed me that you were entertaining this idea of which you had said nothing to a single soul? It was that most knowing of persons, gossip. What, you say, am I such a great personage that I can stir up gossip? Now, there is no reason why you should measure yourself according to this part of the world. Footnote, i.e., Rome. Have regard only to the place where you are dwelling. Any point which rises above adjacent points is great, at the spot where it rises. For greatness is not absolute. Comparison increases or lessens it. A ship which looms large in the river seems tiny when on the ocean. A rudder which is large for one vessel is small for another. So you in your province, footnote, Lucilius was at this time imperial procurator in Sicily. So you in your province are really of importance, though you scorn yourself. Men are asking what you do, how you dine, and how you sleep and they find out too hence there is all the more reason for your living circumspectly do not however deem yourself truly happy until you find that you can live before men's eyes until your walls protect but do not hide you although we are apt to believe that these walls surround us not to enable us to live more safely but that we may sin more secretly I shall mention a fact by which you may weigh the worth of a man's character. You will scarcely find anyone who can live with his door wide open. It is our conscience, not our pride, that has put doorkeepers at our doors. We live in such a fashion that being suddenly disclosed to view is equivalent to being caught in the act. What profits it, however, to hide ourselves away and to avoid the eyes and ears of men? A good conscience welcomes the crowd, but a bad conscience, even in solitude, is disturbed and troubled. If your deeds are honorable, let everybody know them. If base, what matters it that no one knows them, as long as you yourself know them? How wretched you are if you despise such a witness. Farewell. End of chapter 43 Chapter 44 of Moral Letters, Volume 1, by Seneca, translated by Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 44. On Philosophy and Pedigrees. You are again insisting to me that you are a nobody, and saying that nature, in the first place, and fortune, in the second, have treated you too scurvily and this in spite of the fact that you have it in your power to separate yourself from the crowd and rise to the highest human happiness. If there is any good in philosophy, it is this, that it never looks into pedigrees. All men, if traced back to their original source, spring from the gods. You are a Roman knight, and your persistent work promoted you to this class. Yet surely there are many to whom the fourteen rows are barred, footnote, alluding to the seats reserved for the knights at the theater. The senate chamber is not open to all. The army, too, is scrupulous in choosing those whom it admits to toil and danger. But a noble mind is free to all men. According to this test, we may all gain distinction. 
Philosophy neither rejects nor selects anyone. Its light shines for all. Socrates was no aristocrat. Cleanthes worked at a well and served as a hired man watering a garden. Philosophy did not find Plato already a nobleman. It made him one. Why, then, should you despair of becoming able to rank with men like these? They are all your ancestors, if you conduct yourself in a manner worthy of them. And you will do so if you convince yourself at the outset that no man outdoes you in real nobility. We have all had the same number of forefathers. There is no man whose first beginning does not transcend memory. Plato says, Every king springs from a race of slaves, and every slave has had kings among his ancestors. Footnote. Plato. Theaetetus. The flight of time, with its vicissitudes, has jumbled all such things together, and fortune has turned them upside down. Then who is well born? He who is by nature well fitted for virtue. That is the one point to be considered. Otherwise, if you hark back to antiquity, everyone traces back to a date before which there is nothing. From the earliest beginnings of the universe to the present time, we have been led forward out of origins that were alternately illustrious and ignoble. A hall full of smoke-begrimed busts does not make the nobleman. No past life has been lived to lend us glory and that which has existed before us is not ours. The soul alone renders us noble, and it may rise superior to fortune out of any earlier condition, no matter what that condition has been. Suppose, then, that you were not a Roman knight, but a freedman. You might nevertheless, by your own efforts, come to be the only free man amid a throng of gentlemen. How? you ask, simply by distinguishing between good and bad things, without patterning your opinion from the populace. You should look not to the source from which these things come, but to the goal towards which they tend. If there is anything that can make life happy, it is good on its own merits, for it cannot degenerate into evil. Where, then, lies the mistake, since all men crave the happy life? It is that they regard the means for producing happiness as happiness itself, and, while seeking happiness, they are really fleeing from it. For although the sum and substance of the happy life is unalloyed freedom from care, and though the secret of such freedom is unshaken confidence, yet men gather together that which causes worry, and, while traveling life's treacherous road, not only have burdens to bear, but even draw burdens to themselves. Hence they recede farther and farther from the achievement of that which they seek, and the more effort they expend, the more they hinder themselves and are set back. This is what happens when you hurry through a maze. The faster you go, the worse you are entangled. Farewell. End of chapter 44「Chapter 45 of Moral Letters, Volume 1, by Seneca, translated by Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 45. On Sophistical Argumentation You complain that in your part of the world there is a scant supply of books but it is quality rather than quantity that matters. A limited list of reading benefits. A varied assortment serves only for delight. He who would arrive at the appointed end must follow a single road and not wander through many ways. What you suggest is not traveling. It is mere tramping. But, you say, I should rather have you give me advice than books. Still, I am ready to send you all the books I have to ransack the whole storehouse. If it were possible, I should join you there myself 
and were it not for the hope that you will soon complete your term of office, I should have imposed myself this old man's journey. No Scylla or Charybdis, or their storied straits, could have frightened me away. I should not only have crossed over, but should have been willing to swim over those waters, provided that I could greet you and judge in your presence how much you had grown in spirit. Your desire, however, that I should dispatch to you my own writings, does not make me think myself learned, any more than a request for my picture would flatter my beauty. I know that it is due to your charity rather than to your judgment. And even if it is the result of judgment, it was charity that forced the judgment upon you. But whatever the quality of my works may be, read them as if I were still seeking and were not aware of the truth, and were seeking it obstinately too, for I have sold myself to no man, I bear the name of no master. I give much credit to the judgment of great men, but I claim something also for my own. For these men, too, have left to us not positive discoveries, but problems whose solution is still to be sought. They might perhaps have discovered the essentials had they not sought the superfluous also. They lost much time in quibbling about words and in sophistical argumentation. All that sort of thing exercises the wit to no purpose. We tie knots and bind up words in double meanings and then try to untie them. Have we leisure enough for this? Do we already know how to live or die? we should rather proceed with our whole souls towards the point where it is our duty to take heed lest things, as well as words, deceive us. Why, pray, do you discriminate between similar words when nobody is ever deceived by them except during the discussion? It is things that lead us astray. It is between things that you must discriminate. We embrace evil instead of good we pray for something opposite to that which we have prayed for in the past our prayers clash with our prayers our plans with our plans how closely flattery resembles friendship it not only apes friendship but outdoes it passing it in the race with wide open and indulgent ears it is welcomed and sinks to the depths of the heart and it is pleasing precisely wherein it does harm. Show me how I may be able to see through this resemblance. An enemy comes to me full of compliments in the guise of a friend. Vices creep into our hearts under the name of virtues. Rashness lurks beneath the appellation of bravery. Moderation is called sluggishness, and the coward is regarded as prudent. There is great danger if we go astray in these matters, so stamp them with special labels. Then, too, the man who is asked whether he has horns on his head is not such a fool as to feel for them on his forehead, nor again so silly or dense that you can persuade him by means of argumentation, no matter how subtle, that he does not know the facts. Such quibbles are just as harmlessly deceptive as the juggler's cup and dice, in which it is the very trickery that pleases me. But show me how the trick is done, and I have lost my interest therein. And I hold the same opinion about these tricky word plays, for by what other name can one call such sophistries? Not to know them does no harm, and mastering them does no good. At any rate, if you wish to sift doubtful meanings of this kind, teach us that the happy man is not he whom the crowd deems happy, namely he into whose coffers mighty sums have flowed, but he whose possessions are all in his soul, who is upright and exalted, who spurns inconstancy, who sees no man with whom he wishes to change places, who rates men only at their value as men, who takes nature for his teacher, conforming to her laws and living as she commands, whom no violence can deprive of his possessions, who turns evil into good, is unerring in judgment, unshaken, unafraid, 
who may be moved by force but never moved to distraction whom fortune when she hurls at him with all her might the deadliest missile in her armory may graze though rarely but never wound for fortune's other missiles with which she vanquishes mankind in general rebound from such a one like hail which rattles on the roof with no harm to the dweller therein and then melts away why do you bore me with that which you yourself call the liar fallacy footnote e g gellius book eighteen chapter two section ten cum mentior et mentiri me dico mentior an verum dico End footnote. the liar fallacy about which so many books have been written come now suppose that my whole life is a lie prove that to be wrong and if you are sharp enough bring that back to the truth at present it holds things to be essential of which the greater part is superfluous and even that which is not superfluous is of no significance in respect to its power of making one fortunate and blessed for if a thing be necessary it does not follow that it is a good else we degrade the meaning of good if we apply that name to bread and barley porridge and other commodities without which we cannot live the good must in every case be necessary but that which is necessary is not in every case a good since certain very paltry things are indeed necessary no one is to such an extent ignorant of the noble meaning of the word good as to debase it to the level of these humdrum utilities what then shall you not rather transfer your efforts to making it clear to all men that the search for the superfluous means a great outlay of time and that many have gone through life merely accumulating the instruments of life consider individuals survey men in general there is none whose life does not look forward to the morrow what harm is there in this you ask infinite harm for such persons do not live but are preparing to live they postpone everything even if we paid strict attention life would soon get ahead of us but as we are now life finds us lingering and passes us by as if it belonged to another and though it ends on the final day it perishes every day but i must not exceed the bounds of a letter which ought not to fill the reader's left hand footnote a book was unrolled with the right hand the reader gathered up the part already perused with his left hand nearly all books at this time were papyrus rolls as were letters of any great length and footnote so i shall postpone to another day our case against the hair splitters those over subtle fellows who make argumentation supreme instead of subordinate farewell end of chapter forty five chapter forty six of moral letters volume one by seneca translated by gummier this librivox recording is in the public domain forty six on a new book by lucilius i received the book of yours which you promised me i opened it hastily with the idea of glancing over it at leisure for i meant only to taste the volume but by its own charm the book coaxed me into traversing it more at length you may understand from this fact how eloquent it was for it seemed to be written in the smooth style and yet it did not resemble your handiwork or mine but at first sight might have been ascribed to titus livius or to epicurus moreover i was so impressed and carried along by its charm that i finished it without any postponement the sunlight called to me hunger warned and clouds were lowering but i absorbed the book from beginning to end 
I was not merely pleased, I rejoiced. So full of wit and spirit it was. I should have added force, had the book contained moments of repose, or had it risen to energy only at intervals. But I found that there was no burst of force, but an even flow, a style that was vigorous and chaste. Nevertheless, I noticed from time to time your sweetness, and here and there that mildness of yours. Your style is lofty and noble. I want you to keep to this manner and this direction. Your subject also contributed something. For this reason, you should choose productive topics, which will lay hold of the mind and arouse it. I shall discuss the book more fully after a second perusal. Meantime, my judgment is somewhat unsettled, just as if I had heard it read aloud and had not read it myself. You must allow me to examine it also. You need not be afraid. You shall hear the truth. Lucky fellow, to offer a man no opportunity to tell you lies at such long range, unless perhaps, even now, when excuses for lying are taken away, custom serves as an excuse for our telling each other lies. Farewell. End of chapter 46「Chapter 47 of Moral Letters, Volume 1, by Seneca, translated by Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 47. On Master and Slave I am glad to learn, through those who come from you, that you live on friendly terms with your slaves. This befits a sensible and well-educated man like yourself. They are slaves people declare. Nay, rather, they are men. Slaves! No, comrades. Slaves! No, they are unpretentious friends. Slaves! No, they are our fellow slaves, if one reflects that fortune has equal rights over slaves and free men alike. That is why I smile at those who think it degrading for a man to dine with his slave. But why should they think it degrading? It is only because purse-proud etiquette surrounds a householder at his dinner with a mob of standing slaves. The master eats more than he can hold, and with monstrous greed loads his belly until it is stretched, and at length ceases to do the work of a belly so that he is at greater pains to discharge all the food than he was to stuff it down. All this time the poor slaves may not move their lips even to speak. The slightest murmur is repressed by the rod. Even a chance sound, a cough, a sneeze, or a hiccup, is visited with a lash. There is a grievous penalty for the slightest breach of silence. All night long they must stand about, hungry, and dumb. The result of it all is that these slaves, who may not talk in their master's presence, talk about their master. But the slaves of former days, who were permitted to converse not only in their master's presence, but actually with him, whose mouths were not stitched up tight, were ready to bare their necks for their master, to bring upon their own heads any danger that threatened him. They spoke at the feast, but kept silence during torture. Finally, the saying, in allusion to this same high-handed treatment, becomes current. As many enemies as you have slaves. They are not enemies when we acquire them. We make them enemies. I shall pass over other cruel and inhuman conduct towards them, for we maltreat them not as if they were men, but as if they were beasts of burden. When we recline at a banquet, one slave mops up the disgorged food, another crouches beneath the table and gathers up the leftovers of the tipsy guests, another carves the priceless game birds. With unerring strokes and skilled hand he cuts choice morsels along the breast or the rump. Hapless fellow, to live only for the purpose of cutting fat capons correctly. 
unless indeed the other man is still more unhappy than he who teaches this art for pleasure's sake rather than he who learns it because he must another who serves the wine must dress like a woman and wrestle with his advancing years he cannot get away from his boyhood he is dragged back to it and though he has already acquired a soldier's figure he is kept beardless by having his hair smoothed away or plucked out by the roots and he must remain awake throughout the night dividing his time between his master's drunkenness and his lust in the chamber he must be a man at the feast a boy footnote glabri delicati or exoleti were favorite slaves kept artificially youthful by the romans of the more dissolute class and footnote another whose duty it is to put a valuation on the guests must stick to his task poor fellow and watch to see whose flattery and whose immodesty whether of appetite or of language is to get them an invitation for tomorrow think also of the poor purveyors of food who note their master's tastes with delicate skill who know what special flavors will sharpen their appetite what will please their eyes what new combinations will rouse their cloyed stomachs what food will excite their loathing through sheer satiety and what will stir them to hunger on that particular day with slaves like these the master cannot bear to dine he would think it beneath his dignity to associate with his slave at the same table heaven forfend but how many masters is he creating in these very men i have seen standing in the line before the door of callistus the former master of callistus footnote the master of callistus before he became the favorite of caligula is unknown and footnote i have seen the master himself shut out while others were welcomed the master who once fastened the for sale ticket on callistus and put him in the market along with the good-for-nothing slaves but he has been paid off by that slave who was shuffled into the first lot of those on whom the crier practices his lungs the slave too in his turn has cut his name from the list and in his turn has adjudged him unfit to enter his house the master sold callistus but how much has callistus made his master pay for kindly remember that he whom you call your slave sprang from the same stock is smiled upon by the same skies and on equal terms with yourself breathes lives and dies it is just as possible for you to see in him a free-born man as for him to see in you a slave as a result of the massacres in marius's day many a man of distinguished birth who was taking the first steps towards senatorial rank by service in the army was humbled by fortune one becoming a shepherd another a caretaker of a country cottage despise then if you dare those to whose estate you may at any time descend even when you are despising them i do not wish to involve myself in too large a question and to discuss the treatment of slaves towards whom we romans are excessively haughty cruel and insulting but this is the kernel of my advice treat your inferiors as you would be treated by your betters and as often as you reflect how much power you have over a slave remember that your master has just as much power over you but i have no master you say you are still young perhaps you will have one do you not know at what age hecuba entered captivity or croesus or the mother of darius or plato or diogenes footnote plato was about forty years old when he visited sicily whence he was afterwards deported by dionysius the elder he was sold into slavery at aegina and ransomed by a man from cyrene diogenes while travelling from athens to aegina is said to have been captured by pirates and sold in crete 
where he was purchased by a certain Corinthian and given his freedom. End footnote. Associate with your slave on kindly, even on affable, terms. Let him talk with you, plan with you, live with you. I know that at this point all the exquisites will cry out against me in a body. They will say, there is nothing more debasing, more disgraceful than this. But these are the very persons whom I sometimes surprise, kissing the hands of other men's slaves. Do you not see even this, how our ancestors removed from masters everything invidious, and from slaves everything insulting? They called the master father of the household, and the slaves members of the household a custom which still holds in the mime. They established a holiday on which masters and slaves should eat together, not as the only day for this custom, but as obligatory on that day in any case. They allowed the slaves to attain honors in the household and to pronounce judgment, footnote, i.e. as the praetor himself was normally accustomed to do, and footnote they held that a household was a miniature commonwealth do you mean to say comes the retort that i must seat all my slaves at my own table no not any more than that you should invite all free men to it you are mistaken if you think that i would bar from my table certain slaves whose duties are more humble as for example yonder muleteer or yonder herdsman, I propose to value them according to their character, and not according to their duties. Each man acquires his character for himself, but accident assigns his duties. Invite some to your table because they deserve the honor, and others that they may come to deserve it. For if there is any slavish quality in them, as the result of their low associations, it will be shaken off by intercourse with men of gentler breeding. You need not, my dear Lucilius, hunt for friends only in the forum or in the senate house. If you are careful and attentive, you will find them at home also. Good material often stands idle for want of an artist. Make the experiment and you will find it so. As he is a fool who, when purchasing a horse, does not consider the animal's points but merely his saddle and bridle so he is doubly a fool who values a man from his clothes or from his rank which indeed is only a robe that clothes us he is a slave his soul however may be that of a freedman he is a slave but shall that stand in his way Show me a man who is not a slave. One is a slave to lust, another to greed, another to ambition, and all men are slaves to fear. I will name you an ex-consul who is slave to an old hag, a millionaire who is slave to a serving-maid. I will show you youths of the noblest birth in serfdom to pantomime players. No servitude is more disgraceful than that which is self-imposed. You should, therefore, not be deterred by these finicky persons from showing yourself to your slaves as an affable person and not proudly superior to them. They ought to respect you rather than fear you. Some may maintain that I am now offering the liberty cap to slaves in general and toppling down lords from their high estate because i bid slaves respect their masters instead of fearing them they say this is what he plainly means slaves are to pay respect as if they were clients or early morning callers anyone who holds this opinion forgets that what is enough for a god cannot be too little for a master respect means love and love and fear cannot be mingled so I hold that you are entirely right in not wishing to be feared by your slaves, and in lashing them merely with the tongue. Only dumb animals need the thong. 
that which annoys us does not necessarily injure us but we are driven into wild rage by our luxurious lives so that whatever does not answer our whims arouses our anger we don the temper of kings for they too forgetful alike of their own strength and of other men's weakness grow white hot with rage as if they had received an injury when they are entirely protected from danger of such injury by their exalted station they are not unaware that this is true but by finding fault they seize upon opportunities to do harm they insist that they have received injuries in order that they may inflict them i do not wish to delay you longer for you need no exhortation this among other things is a mark of good character it forms its own judgments and abides by them but badness is fickle and frequently changing not for the better but for something different farewell end of chapter 47「Chapter forty eight of Moral Letters, Volume One by Seneca, translated by Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Forty eight on quibbling as unworthy of the philosopher. In answer to the letter which you wrote to me while traveling, a letter as long as the journey itself, I shall reply later. I ought to go into retirement and consider what sort of advice i should give you for you yourself who consult me also reflected for a long time whether to do so how much more then should i myself reflect since more deliberation is necessary in settling than in propounding a problem and this is particularly true when one thing is advantageous to you and another to me am i speaking again in the guise of an epicurean footnote the epicureans who reduced all goods to utilities could not regard a friend's advantage as identical with one's own advantage and yet they laid great stress upon friendship as one of the chief sources of pleasure for an attempt to reconcile these two positions see cicero de finibus book one section sixty five folio seneca has inadvertently used a phrase that implies a difference between a friend's interests and one's own this leads him to reassert the stoic view of friendship which adopted as its motto koina ta ton philon and footnote but the fact is the same thing is advantageous to me which is advantageous to you for i am not your friend unless whatever is at issue concerning you is my concern also friendship produces between us a partnership in all our interests there is no such thing as good or bad fortune for the individual we live in common and no one can live happily who has regard to himself alone and transforms everything into a question of his own utility you must live for your neighbor if you would live for yourself this fellowship maintained with scrupulous care which makes us mingle as men with our fellow-men and holds that the human race have certain rights in common is also of great help in cherishing the more intimate fellowship which is based on friendship concerning which i began to speak above for he that has much in common with a fellow-man will have all things in common with a friend and on this point my excellent lucilius i should like to have those subtle dialecticians of yours advise me how i ought to help a friend or how a fellow-man rather than tell me in how many ways the word friend is used and how many meanings the word man possesses lo wisdom and folly are taking opposite sides which shall i join which party would you have me follow on that side man is the equivalent of friend on the other side 
friend is not the equivalent of man the one wants a friend for his own advantage the other wants to make himself an advantage to his friend footnote the sides are given in reverse order in the two clauses to the stoic the terms friend and man are coextensive he is the friend of everybody and his motive in friendship is to be of service the epicurean however narrows the definition of friend and regards him merely as an instrument to his own happiness and footnote what you have to offer me is nothing but distortion of words and splitting of syllables it is clear that unless i can devise some very tricky premises and by false deductions tack on to them a fallacy which springs from the truth i shall not be able to distinguish between what is desirable and what is to be avoided i am ashamed old men as we are dealing with a problem so serious we make play of it mouse is a syllable now a mouse eats cheese therefore a syllable eats cheese suppose now that i cannot solve this problem see what peril hangs over my head as a result of such ignorance what a scrape i shall be in without doubt i must beware or some day i shall be catching syllables in a mousetrap or if i grow careless a book may devour my cheese unless perhaps the following syllogism is shrewder still mouse is a syllable now a syllable does not eat cheese therefore a mouse does not eat cheese what childish nonsense do we knit our brows over this sort of problem do we let our beards grow long for this reason is this the matter which we teach with sour and pale faces would you really know what philosophy offers to humanity philosophy offers counsel death calls away one man and poverty chafes another a third is worried either by his neighbor's wealth or by his own so and so is afraid of bad luck another desires to get away from his own good fortune some are ill-treated by men others by the gods why then do you frame for me such games as these it is no occasion for jest you are retained as counsel for unhappy mankind you have promised to help those in peril by sea those in captivity the sick and the needy and those whose heads are under the poised axe whither are you straying what are you doing this friend in whose company you are jesting is in fear help him and take the noose from about his neck men are stretching out imploring hands to you on all sides lives ruined and in danger of ruin are begging for some assistance men's hopes men's resources depend upon you they ask that you deliver them from all their restlessness that you reveal to them scattered and wandering as they are the clear light of truth tell them what nature has made necessary and what superfluous tell them how simple are the laws that she has laid down how pleasant and unimpeded life is for those who follow those laws but how bitter and perplexed it is for those who have put their trust in opinion rather than in nature i should deem your games of logic to be of some avail in relieving men's burdens if you could first show me what part of these burdens they will relieve what among these games of yours banishes lust or controls it would that i could say that they were merely of no profit they are positively harmful i can make it perfectly clear to you whenever you wish that a noble spirit when involved in such subtleties is impaired and weakened i am ashamed to say what weapons they supply to men who are destined to go to war with fortune and how poorly they equip them is this the path to the greatest good is philosophy to proceed by such claptrap and by quibbles which would be a disgrace and a reproach even for expounders of the law for what else is it that you men are doing 
when you deliberately ensnare the persons to whom you are putting questions than making it appear that the man has lost his case on a technical error footnote in certain actions the praetor appointed a judge and established a formula indicating the plaintiff's claim and the judge's duty if the statement was false or the claim excessive the plaintiff lost his case under certain conditions the defendant could claim annulment of the formula and have the case tried again such cases were not lost on their merits and for that reason the lawyer who purposely took such an advantage was doing a contemptible thing and footnote but just as the judge can reinstate those who have lost a suit in this way so philosophy has reinstated these victims of quibbling to their former condition why do you men abandon your mighty promises and after having assured me in high-sounding language that you will permit the glitter of gold to dazzle my eyesight no more than the gleam of the sword and that i shall with mighty steadfastness spurn both that which all men crave and that which all men fear why do you descend to the a b c's of scholastic pedants what is your answer is this the path to heaven footnote virgil aeneid book nine line six hundred forty one for that is exactly what philosophy promises to me that i shall be made equal to god for this i have been summoned for this purpose have i come philosophy keep your promise therefore my dear lucilius withdraw yourself as far as possible from these exceptions and objections of so-called philosophers frankness and simplicity beseem true goodness even if there were many years left to you you would have had to spend them frugally in order to have enough for the necessary things but as it is when your time is so scant what madness is it to learn superfluous things farewell End of chapter 48。chapter 49。of moral letters volume 1 by Seneca。translated by Gummier。this librivox recording is in the public domain。forty nine。on the shortness of life。a man is indeed lazy and careless。my dear lucilius。if he is reminded of a friend only by seeing some landscape which stirs the memory and yet there are times when the old familiar haunts stir up a sense of loss that has been stored away in the soul not bringing back dead memories but rousing them from their dormant state just as the sight of a lost friend's favorite slave or his cloak or his house renews the mourner's grief even though it has been softened by time now lo and behold campania and especially naples and your beloved pompeii footnote probably the birthplace of lucilius struck me when i viewed them with a wonderfully fresh sense of longing for you you stand in full view before my eyes i am on the point of parting from you i see you choking down your tears and resisting without success the emotions that well up at the very moment when you try to check them i seem to have lost you but a moment ago for what is not but a moment ago when one begins to use the memory it was but a moment ago that i sat as a lad in the school of the philosopher sotion footnote the pythagorean for his views on vegetarianism and their influence on seneca see epistle one hundred eight but a moment ago that i began to plead in the courts but a moment ago that i lost the desire to plead but a moment ago that i lost the ability infinitely swift is the flight of time as those see more clearly who are looking backwards for when we are intent on the present we do not notice it so gentle is the passage of time's headlong flight do you ask the reason for this all past time 
is in the same place. It all presents the same aspect to us. It lies together. Everything slips into the same abyss. Besides, an event which in its entirety is of brief compass cannot contain long intervals. The time which we spend in living is but a point, nay, even less than a point. But this point of time, infinitesimal as it is, nature has mocked by making it seem outwardly of longer duration. She has taken one portion thereof and made it infancy, another childhood, another youth, another the gradual slope, so to speak, from youth to old age, and old age itself is still another. How many steps for how short a climb! It was but a moment ago that I saw you off on your journey, and yet this moment ago makes up a goodly share of our existence, which is so brief, we should reflect, that it will soon come to an end altogether. In other years, time did not seem to me to go so swiftly. Now it seems fast beyond belief, perhaps because I feel that the finish line is moving closer to me. Or it may be that I have begun to take heed and reckon up my losses. For this reason I am all the more angry that some men claim the major portion of this time for superfluous things time which no matter how carefully it is guarded cannot suffice even for necessary things cicero declared that if the number of his days were doubled he should not have time to read the lyric poets footnote an intentional equivocation on the part of cicero who intimates that he will lose no time in reading them and footnote and you may rate the dialecticians in the same class, but they are foolish in a more melancholy way. The lyric poets are avowedly frivolous, but the dialecticians believe that they are themselves engaged upon serious business. I do not deny that one must cast a glance at dialectic, but it ought to be a mere glance, a sort of greeting from the threshold merely that one may not be deceived or judge these pursuits to contain any hidden matters of great worth why do you torment yourself and lose weight over some problem which it is more clever to have scorned than to solve when a soldier is undisturbed and travelling at his ease he can hunt for trifles along his way but when the enemy is closing in on the rear and a command is given to quicken the pace necessity makes him throw away everything which he picked up in moments of peace and leisure i have no time to investigate disputed inflections of words or to try my cunning upon them behold the gathering clans the fast shut gates and weapons wedded ready for the war Footnote virgil aeneid book eight line three hundred eighty five folio i need a stout heart to hear without flinching this din of battle which sounds round about and all would rightly think me mad if when greybeards and women were heaping up rocks for the fortifications when the armor-clad youths inside the gates were awaiting or even demanding the order for a sally when the spears of the foemen were quivering in our gates and the very ground was rocking with mines and subterranean passages i say they would rightly think me mad if i were to sit idle putting such petty posers as this what you have not lost you have but you have not lost any horns therefore you have horns or other tricks constructed after the model of this piece of sheer silliness and yet i may well seem in your eyes no less mad if i spend my energies on that sort of thing and yet in the former case it would be merely a peril from the outside that threatened me and a wall that sundered me from the foe as it is now death-dealing perils are in my very presence I have no time for such nonsense. A mighty undertaking is on my hands. What am I to do? 
death is on my trail and life is fleeting away teach me something with which to face these troubles bring it to pass that i shall cease trying to escape from death and that life may cease to escape from me give me courage to meet hardships make me calm in the face of the unavoidable relax the straitened limits of the time which is allotted me show me that the good in life does not depend upon life's length but upon the use we make of it also that it is possible or rather usual for a man who has lived long to have lived too little say to me when i lie down to sleep you may not wake again and when i have waked you may not go to sleep again say to me when i go forth from my house you may not return and when i return you may never go forth again you are mistaken if you think that only on an ocean voyage there is a very slight space between life and death footnote i e the timbers of the ship compare the same figure in epistle thirty no the distance between is just as narrow everywhere it is not everywhere that death shows himself so near at hand yet everywhere he is as near at hand rid me of these shadowy terrors then you will more easily deliver to me the instruction for which i have prepared myself at our birth nature made us teachable and gave us reason not perfect but capable of being perfected discuss for me justice duty thrift and that twofold purity both the purity which abstains from another's person and that which takes care of one's own self if you will only refuse to lead me along bypaths i shall more easily reach the goal at which i am aiming for as the tragic poet says the language of truth is simple footnote euripides foi line 469 we should not therefore make that language intricate since there is nothing less fitting for a soul of great endeavor than such crafty cleverness farewell end of chapter 49